so let me know if the slides don't uh, come up. Uh, my name is Daniel Coyle. I'm the program coordinator for IOM uh, sitting with uh, site management, site development. My, my official kind of responsibility is CWC within uh, SMSD. Um, I'm going to kind of run through a lot of slides today, and uh, we may not like read through everything, but I kind of wanted to put everything in one place uh, just so that you could refer to it later if it's helpful for you. Um, generally, something I noticed coming into the response was that there's a lot of general guidance on accountability and on CFM. Uh, there's tons of documents that are kind of maybe useful in outlining broad strokes around what we should be doing. Um, but I found actually very little operational guidance, uh, both kind of in the response here, but also globally in other contexts in terms of like how to, how to make these values happen in the field, especially in large responses where you have multiple actors and kind of uh, many different coordination challenges. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I really did in, in approaching the design of the CFM was, was trying to approach it as if it was a service like anything else. Uh, and, and kind of analyze how people interacted and used it and how efficient it was as if it was a service. And in this, I think it's kind of useful to think about CFM and people's engagement in these systems and how these systems work um, in that same framing as we would approach, you know, a WASH program or a health program. Um, so uh, maybe to give you some general context on CFM, I think it's important to note that while this presentation maybe portrays uh, a functioning system, I want to be clear that uh, I think that the story of CFM in the Cox Bazaar response uh, is, is not a positive one. A recent study in over 200 uh, that kind of had over 200 qualitative interviews generally found that most people feel like these systems don't work in the response. Uh, there's a lot of frustration surrounding them. People feel like they go again and again and they really don't get the help they need and they don't get feedback. Um, so I really wanted to just put that out there and have that kind of back shadow what we're talking about because we're very much talking about a system that's trying to make improvements and maybe still in the eyes of the affected population, failing far short, far short of what, um, what we would actually hope for. Um, so kind of in the beginning, I, I started uh, around two years ago on this system. And uh, again, there was a lot of uh, top level guidance on terms of how things should be done. We, and, and even some guidance within the response that was a bit more specific in terms of you know, this data should be collected, this data shouldn't be collected, it should be re referred here or there. Um, you know, and I found that a lot of agencies were presenting their systems as very different. Uh, and there were a lot of debates over uh, one system being kind of very different than another, but, but actually when it got down to it, we were all more or less using the same practices. And I didn't see a lot of functional differences. I think the biggest difference was whether you were using kind of a paper form or a Kobo form. Um, but generally speaking, you know, all the CFM stuff is supposed to be referred, uh, very little clarity or guidance on how that was supposed to be done. Um, and generally, uh, what I did was I, I kind of started thinking about, uh, you know, the CFM process according to these different stages. So you, you receive data, and I, I noticed some problems there. I mean, often the agency in the response receiving the data is not necessarily the agency that's responsible for it, especially in, in kind of the congested camps of, of the Cox response. Um, and often there's a, a really complex situation where, you know, you're taking the information in for a different sector or a different operational actor. Um, and, and generally these teams that are taking the data are not the teams that are responsible for resolving them. But, you know, the person sitting at the desk still has to understand pretty much the entire architecture of the response, the sector system, mandates on particular issues. And, and that kind of becomes very complicated just when you talk about what do I need to do in order to receive a complaint from someone. Um, then we have problems related to the referral process. You know, agencies were, were referring different information or, you know, more problematically, when you referred things to them would require different information to be referred to them. So one agency says, you know, we need this number, another agency asking for another number. Um, and, and generally in this referral process, you see like, you know, agencies after they refer an issue, give up sort of the responsibility or the mandate for taking further action. It's, it's supposed to be kind of a handover of that feedback. Uh, and that, that I saw was also a really big issue because that, that very rarely happens, I felt like. Um, and then in terms of how issues were actually responded to, I mean, again and again, I'm, I'm frequently asked by donors or coordinators of, you know, how many issues do we fix? But, but that's a really complicated question because I don't, you know, what fixing something looks like really depends on, you know, what the person has come to us with. And, you know, sometimes we just don't fix things because that's outside of the scope of the system. So people 
asking for additional assistance, people asking for more than the standards allow. Um, and you know, what does it mean to kind of fix this or resolve this? And there wasn't really any common language or understanding around how we should be resolving or calling things resolved or not resolved. Um, and then, and then finally, you know, I think a big thing that that always appears on the Cox response is the failure to close the feedback loop. That even when things are successfully dealt with, that person is often, you know, not communicated back to and doesn't really feel part of a, a, a full circle in that process. And we lose a lot of the trust building, the relationship building uh, in that. Uh, and then in generally, you know, when, when we do fail, the person just feels like there's been no point in making their complaint and they're unsure, you know, whether any action was taken beyond recording it. Um, so this is, this is kind of a little bit of a conceptual map of, of the different problems. Um, so yeah, I, I want to talk briefly about this idea of splitting the mandate. So in many, many cases, in, in most systems here, I found that once something's referred, the agency who referred it kind of says, well, it's no longer our responsibility. We've given it to the responsible agency and now it's their job to take the process forward. Um, and this didn't, this didn't really feel okay to me because I felt if you're running a, a multi-sector or a multi-functioning CFM, that's not just taking complaints about your own programming, but you're willing to take complaints about food or you know, whatever sector it is, you really are also to me needing to be take some responsibility for conducting a follow-up on that case. And, and even if you can't resolve their problem, I think you, you're sort of obligated um, ethically to go back to the person and say, we did try, we're really sorry. You know, maybe it's the responsible agency you dropped the ball, maybe something else happened. But um, I, I just felt like, you know, it's really important to close the feedback loop and, and knowing that often the agencies we refer things to don't do that. There's no reason we shouldn't do that because people are coming to us because they trust us um, and they are sharing their problems with us. And I, I didn't want to lose that sort of human element to that process. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of, uh, in the background of what we were doing, had a bunch of floating principles uh, that I think these are, these are not necessarily to keep in all contexts and responses. And I, I definitely think some of these would have to be adapted, but I think they're all worth considering about your own systems. Like, are you gonna take every, every kind of complaint and feedback for us in Cox Bazaar that was really important? given our role as site management, how many sectors IOM does cover and provide services in, uh, and just kind of our coordination mandate uh, in, in half, of, half of the camps. Um, you know, there's other things like whether you're gonna use kind of dedicated tools or more common tools, such as like Kobo versus a, a customized application, which some agencies have done here. Um, yeah, and then at the end of the day, I mean, I think a big goal for me was not, not to, to say our system works perfectly, but to really show what is moving through the system well and, and what isn't. Uh, and I really wanted to create a higher level of transparency on the whole the feedback process, all stages of that, you know, what is moving through and what is getting stuck. Um, that's been a bit of a, a challenge from a, a data angle, but I'll talk about what we've done to address it. Um, to, to think a little bit uh, about this idea of collective, um, because behind, you know, designing a good CFM, we really wanted to also kind of create standards and introduce a common system. Uh, and there are, there are a lot of pitfalls. I think one of the pitfalls I noticed was everyone gets in a, into a debate over like a perfect system. And, and there are agencies here saying, you know, we have like a hundred percent resolve rate. I, I don't think that's really helpful to anyone. I think, I think we need to be honest that probably in every response, there's never going to be a hundred percent especially if you get down to the nitty gritty and think about many of these cases, we're just not able to do for funding issues or, you know, the, the requests being outside assistance standards. Um, you know, something that was helpful to us is, is framing common as not meaning everyone. And we really started with agencies like DRC and UNHCR who, who had interest and willingness and also a big enough operation to kind of push something forward without getting, you know, bogged down in, in a fight over, you know, what is the best way or whose system do we use? Because those conversations politically aren't really helpful. Um, and really what we need to do to build common systems is create common agreements. And that's really about everyone coming together. And it's not about what's perfect. It's really about getting people the information they need in order to take action on a specific request or complaint um, that are often kind of very pragmatic and service uh, related, especially in our context. Um, so kind of off of this, these are, these are kind of just other general rules and guidance. Um, really sitting down, I know it's not exciting, and talking about like, what is feedback? You know, how are we going to label issues? Uh, 
you know, and, and really sorting through the types of issues that you guys actually collect in field is really critical in, in getting a system that has some uniformity and can speak, you know, between agencies and different sectors. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's other ways of going about doing this. Once you have that, you need to have kind of some similar practices and operational trainings. Um, and then generally our approach to kind of a collective system has been, you know, if you build a good functioning tool that is not a bunch of money and, and you're willing to support agencies adoption of it, um, agencies will adopt. And I think, I think we're seeing that um, right now in our, our, you know, kind of expansion of our system where more and more agencies are just simply, you know, interested in our system because it, it can do more than what their existing system is able to do. And it's already kind of better linked up into different sectors and operational workflows that are, are kind of uh, important for people in the camps. Um, okay, so uh, at the end of the day, I think, again, to bring this down to a very pragmatic level, uh, I've noticed that when I talk about CFM, there's kind of like a tension in the room, maybe, maybe not in this room, but in other rooms with, uh, especially if you're talking to protection actors, or if you're talking, uh, you know, internally to HR, maybe they feel that CFM is very much about code of conduct or very much about protection issues. Uh, and, and I want to kind of point out that when I analyzed our CFM, when I came in, you know, from day one till now, 98 to 99% of our CFM is, is service related feedback and requests. There is code of conduct stuff there. There is protection referrals happening, um, but that's really not the bulk of what we deal with. It's important that we deal with those well, but you know, I, I feel like we often get bogged down in talking about the most sensitive things that could possibly come into a CFM system as opposed to kind of the general stuff that is moving through the system to begin with. So I, I kind of, uh, you know, in this, I think sometimes it's, it's more helpful to think of CFM as a part of service monitoring or as part of service facilitation. Like a lot of times, and, and most of the time, it's people coming and asking for help on how to change their beneficiary ID cards, uh, you know, how to, how to change their address locations in the camp. And, and this is really, I think, uh, uh, not given as much attention sometimes, because when we do present the system formally, we, we get very quickly bogged down in a debate about sensitive details. And, and those issues are really easily dealt with within our system. And I think anyone's system, you can, you can do a lot to, to control data uh, in a sensitive way. Um, so I, I think maybe you guys are probably curious about what we've actually done. Uh, you know, to kick it off, I wanna say that, that what we have is called the Common Feedback Platform. Uh, it's currently used by eight agencies and, and it's kind of governed not by a sector or, or kind of a coordinator because we really feel it's valuable to have operational actors who, who have a lot of time in the fields and are kind of linked into programming teams involved. And so we have people from DRC, UNHCR and IOM on a steering committee uh, and, and we kind of oversee and we're slowly working on trying to improve the workflows uh, of the system over time. Um, it, it's kind of based on a set of standards that were produced uh, as part of a task force within the CWC working group. So, so kind of the standards we are using are common within the response, even if they're not used, they are endorsed. Uh, and now we have kind of over 300 enumerators across these agencies working in the system, collecting and managing community feedback. And we're also producing IM outputs uh, and analytics that we share with other coordinators and, and kind of are publicly available. Um, to give you some idea of the volume we're dealing with, uh, it, it's kind of quite surprising, I find, when, when you take a step back. So this year alone, we already have 75,000 tickets. A ticket is what we refer to as a piece of community feedback. It may end up being a protection referral, uh, feedback, uh, request, question. We label them different ways, but everything is called a ticket. Um, in, in one month in April, we got 15,000 tickets alone. Uh, and, and this year, we've already made 31,000 referrals. This date is a bit old, it's actually in April. Um, yeah, and, and uh, essentially like 67% of what we referred is reported resolved. We're trying to do some independent verification of that, but uh, we are tracking how often the person at the end of the day does tell us this issue has been solved. Uh, and then we're also keeping track of how many times we are closing the feedback loop. So uh, 21,000 replies were made by end of April, which uh, and we're, we're again, pretty proud of. Again, it's not where we want to be at the end of the day, but uh, you know, it is somewhere and we do know where we're at in terms of improving our own system. Uh, these are, this is an example of the, the kind of monthly based camp outputs that we're sharing. Uh, so we share this on a monthly basis within the coordination structure. And this one was a big deal because it was the first month where we had kind of some coverage in all the camps. You can see it's, it's not the same everywhere, but this is, a, you know, this is a part of how we're trying to analyze 
the coverage of our system and, and how people are engaging it. Um, for sure, it's a mistake to think camps with more, more tickets uh, don't function as well. Often we see camps that function the best in terms of coordination. We, we often see more tickets and more engagement in the system. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of funny, but actually we, we see sort of a higher rate of uh, engagement as, as a positive sign that, that something might be working. Um, we've also kind of begun to break down the data by sectors, and we find it's quite it's becoming more useful to look at how sectors are performing across camps, because for many reasons, there might be uh, contextual limitations in a specific camp, but, but, you know, more or less, we should be able to see whether, you know, what the general resolution rate for, for a specific sector is. You'll see now, and in, in this graph on the right, you know, this is for site development, a lot of the, the tickets are unresolved. You know, part of that is because some of the lockdown issues we're having, and, and more of it is a reflection of the fact that the system is literally just starting in many of those camps. So it takes about a month or two for these issues, you know, to have any action taken on them. Uh, and then we also have kind of a lot of new enumerators. So the, the 4%, please don't take that as a, as like, that's where it is. This is a, a little bit of a reflection of the system just starting. Um, yeah, so, so to kind of break down how we do this and how we get to that IM output. Uh, first, you know, we have a, a very developed COVO form uh, that we receive kind of information through. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk you through kind of what that form has uh, and why it maybe is, uh, has some special features. From there, that, that form generates a ticket number. Uh, and that ticket number is allows us kind of what allows us to track uh, kind of the complaint throughout the process. Um, essentially, this data is exported into an access database. And we have Excel files that are linked up to that database. So once a week, the camp managers and whoever's responsible will get an Excel file uh, with a bunch of sheets for each sector on it. And that data automatically refreshes and, and camp managers kind of get a sheet of every issue that's open in their camp that they need to refer and kind of track. Um, you know, those are referred through the coordination structure, coordination meetings, emails uh, to the responsible agencies and the sector focal points. Uh, they're supposed to take action on it, uh, hopefully, and, and delegate it within their area of responsibility if they're sharing, you know, uh, or they have like a block-based coordination system. Um, when they're done with it, uh, we, we kind of uh, hear back from them or we're supposed to hear back from them. And then we actually go back to the person and we fill out a second form, which we call the reply form. And this allows us to kind of verify with the person whether the issue has actually been resolved. And in that process, we enter the ticket number uh, so that we can actually merge the complaint record in the access database at the end of the day. Uh, and this is how we're able to generate kind of a stronger, more robust reporting on different stages of the complaint process. Uh, and uh, it, it's pretty much something anyone can introduce in any response. It's uh, not, not re unique, it's a built-in function that you can set up in Kobo. Um, I wanna run you a little bit uh, through Kobo. This might be very nerdy and technical, and I apologize if you know this or you're not interested in IM issues, but I think it's helpful in, in realizing how to turn Kobo into a better CFM tool. Um, you know, one of the things you can do is we have over 300 enumerators, and it is really important that we know who took this issue so we can follow up with them if something's wrong, uh, if they're entering information in the form wrong, we, we can give them feedback, or just if we need more information, you know, we need to know who put that data in. So we've given everyone a unique three-digit number, and if they enter that in, it actually automatically adds in their name, their unit, their contact information, and that gets attached to the, to the ticket that's generated. So that's, that's kind of quite useful. Um, we also have, uh, you know, done this, this really boring job of standardizing how everything is called. So, you know, you'll, you'll see here that this is exactly how this ticket will appear at the, at the end of the complaint. It will say it's a drainage and, and drainage cover issue. Uh, and the, this particular issue is it's blocked or waterlogging. Um, you know, this sounds like a boring problem, but it, it's really helpful in terms of adding up the data and doing that analysis at the end of the day. Uh, and, and kind of it, it helps standardize the language uh, in which different operational actors are communicating with each other. Because oftentimes what will happen is, is one agency or sector is referring to a problem a different way. And especially if you have a person at a help desk, uh, you know, the way people report these issues to you is not always how the operational agency refers to them as. So this is where we, we kind of emphasize common language. You'll, you'll see that, um, you know, my favorite is some, some agencies report issues as hasn't received intended entitlement. You know, no, no beneficiary is ever gonna come and say that language to you. And so creating these forms is oftentimes a process of, you know, 
you know, capturing how an affected person will report this problem to you, but also then being able to translate that into the, the correct operational action that's needed to, to kind of happen. Um, so we even have tables where like, this is how it's recorded in our system. And this is what WFP or UNHCR registration team needs to do, you know, in order to kind of resolve this problem. Uh, and this is all kind of choice filters and drop downs. So, so again, part of, part of the doing this is to really make it easy to the team members so that they don't have to identify, you know, what sectors uh, everything belongs to. The system does it for them and, you know, they don't have to second guess. Um, after they identify what's issue, this is, this is kind of a nifty thing we've done. There's a customized message that actually displays and that, that can be, uh, that's like based on the particular issue they're reporting. So whatever they're reporting, they'll get a message either in English or Bangla, whichever they prefer, that you know, is a message that they're supposed to explain to the person. So again, keeping in mind there's like 80 or 90 standard issues in our system that cover the bulk of community feedback, you know, those tens of thousands of cases that we're dealing with. Um, it's really hard to, for them to remember like 80 different messages about each and every complaint. And some of these messages are, this is not gonna be addressed because you know, this isn't something we deal with. So, so actually, you know, programming in that language and that explanation really helps the field teams uh, you know, uh, update their knowledge because this information also changes. So we can actually change it on the back end and then they get a new message and they can kind of see as things are changing um, in the field. And they also don't have to remember everything. Uh, yeah, and this is just to show you how the message changes. So this is now a, a newborn child issue. And then here's like an updated explanation that we just updated uh, yesterday uh, because UNHCR changed some of their registration practices. Uh, you know, we, we can introduce scannable barcodes. So if you, your uh, beneficiaries or your affected populations, they have IDs with, with uh, QR codes or barcodes, you can actually scan that in. Uh, you know, in our system, it actually can pull in the name, the gender, the age of the person. That's all really uh, helpful in terms of analysis. And it also just makes CFM entry much faster. You know, this is how we're able to deal with thousands of these issues with, with a fewer number of people. Uh, here you can just see basically, we've also done a lot in making sure the data isn't what we call junk data. So uh, because the ID uh, fields can be quite complex and because they're entering so many, there we had a, a big problem where we were trying to refer stuff and people are like, you know, we can't find this person or this ID doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, this sort of programming and constraints, it's not really exciting work, but it really is helpful in, in terms of improving the quality of referrals that you're able to make. And so our system is actually set up to kind of auto detect errors in different ways uh, and even analyze whether the barcode is scanning correctly. Um, at the end, you can actually uh, use the form to, to process this data automatically. So this is an example at the end of every uh, form they fill out in Kobo, it actually shows them a little summary like this of, of the ticket information. So this is a ticket submitted by Danny and I'm complaining about a damaged lamppost. Um, and then it is related to site development. And again, a lot of this is to, to kind of remove the, the work on, you know, IM people or on uh, the field teams in, in kind of collating this data. And this is exactly how it gets referred. So to show you that, this is an example of not, now after that data is exported, put into a database, it connects to a simple Excel file. This is just a screenshot of that file. And you can see it has tags for each and every sector. And each and every sector actually has the specific information that that sector needs in order to make that referral. So for site development, they maybe need facility information or geo coordinates. For WASH, they maybe need latrine codes. You know, for shelter, NS, uh, uh, shelter NFI, sorry. They, they need like maybe the house number or the FCN number. So we, we actually talked to each sector, figured out what they needed and then customized the form to prompt, you know, to, to gather the data for specifically what that issue is related to. So not to gather data just willy nilly, but, but to gather specific information. And then that's actually what goes in the referral form. And it's really easy to change. I mean, it is a bunch of work uh, on, on our side in making the change, but we can change the whole system in, in, a, in a day if, if there's like that much urgency uh, associated with it. Uh, currently, we're working on a dedicated application, which is a bit exciting, and I, I want to just tell you about it because it is open source. So, um, you know, you, you're, you know, free to go ahead and use it and, and try and deploy it in your responses if that's of interest to you. Uh, we hope to have everyone using this application, at least in IOM's uh, side, uh, in the next couple of months. We, we initiated the work, so, you know, we need to take the first step. Um, but basically, it's based off Kobo ODK. 
So the plan is that we actually just move our existing Kobo forms into a cloud-based application uh, with a lot more features and functionality because currently, you know, Kobo is, is an online offline system where you have to download the data. So this would be real time. It gets submitted and it gets referred immediately as opposed to waiting for those uh, backend IM inputs uh, that we're currently having to provide. Uh, and we're able to actually set up kind of customized workflows. So this is an example of, you know, after the, the complaint form's filled out, the form looks the same. So I'm not gonna show it to you because you've just seen it. Um, but, but it actually, you know, you can log into a, a customized user interface. Uh, you know, the, the case gets referred here. It's a, a case that says cash for work, has not been selected for cash for work in a long time. Uh, the person who's responsible for, for that issue, uh, you know, can, can write a comment there. This woman has been selected for cash for work in two weeks. You know, please tell her they can mark it as resolved or unresolved. Uh, and then that information actually goes back to the user's device and they, and it actually tells them, okay, like, you know, go back to this woman and let her know uh, this message and let her know the status of her ticket. Um, so, so hopefully we're, you know, we're hoping that these like kind of basic improvements will, will streamline a lot and the help will, you know, also one of the major problems in this solely Kobo access system is that you do have a bunch of gaps in terms of when data is exported. Uh, so moving to kind of a streamlined system where we can record what actions each person is taking in one platform should be should be a lot better. Um, yeah, and if you're interested, you can kind of check it out and request a demo from the, the team that's helping us develop it. Um, in terms of closing remarks, hopefully I haven't gone over. Seems like I'm on time. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I want to say that, that, you know, I've been trying to go through kind of things that we've done that have worked, but my general advice and my general learning from CFM is that We've tried a bunch that has failed, and it, you know Bruce introducing the session would know that my first uh, attempt failed miserably, and I spent three months on something that just wasn't going to work. Um, so you know, don't give up. And and generally, I think if you're really serious in pursuing this, it does help to have people with dedicated time to look at this because it is a really complicated issue when you start conceptualizing that you're really trying to get a handle on all the different workflows and all the different data that each and every sector needs. Um, so, so really don't underestimate how challenging these systems can be to develop and implement effectively. Um, in that, maybe there's a, a lesson learned on the, the collective aspect of if you do build something that works, it's more likely to be collective. Like I, I think people will sign up to a system that, that you've been able to demonstrate works effectively. Um, and generally just don't mistake, like just because you're not able to resolve everyone's problem, I don't think that's a reflection of your system. Like we have a lot of unresolved problems right now because our camps are in lockdown and we can't get in there to, to do a lot of the things that people are requesting. Um, but this is now really important advocacy data to show how, you know, what is the impact in terms of how, when programming is messed up or when operations are halted, it does create a CFM backlog. We have a huge backlog of registration issues uh, because registration services have had to close because of lockdowns. So, you know, we have like 15,000 issues pending. And I think you can kind of really see that um, in our system. I'm going to end it there because I think I'm probably at time. Um, thank you very much. And I'll share the form in the, the chat box. Thanks, Daniel. That was a really comprehensive um, presentation. And I think there are a lot of camp managers on the call at the moment who have struggled building complaints and feedback mechanisms that would really benefit from um, <clears throat> your presentation and any guidance that you can share. I guess my only question, um, we only have about a couple minutes is, um, obviously we built the system in Cox Bazaar, you have 300 enumerators um, collecting all the data. Can you talk a little bit about the scalability, maybe re replicability of this system um, in different contexts and just sort of like the amount of time and some of the resources you required <clears throat> um, in order to design the system. I really liked your point about being allowed to fail, because I think in order to come up with a system this refined, you probably needed to go down quite a few dead ends before you found a path um, to what you currently have. Yeah, so I, I you know, in, in those basic values I talked about, one of them was like nothing, nothing that was costly and nothing that couldn't be adapted, because I just knew that we weren't going to get it right the first time and we were going to have to keep, you know, reiterating it and changing what data that sector needs. So, so in terms of replicability, I think it's replicable. And I think you know, it's time and investment and having these conversations. But if you have the time, the, the actual costs are, are very minimal. And whether you have a big team or a small team, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think you could probably make it simpler if you have a much smaller operation. Um, but, but yeah, it just actually makes things easier if you, if you don't have to take it to such a scale. 
Um, so yeah, and, and as I said, all the tools and everything I've shown you is more or less free to do. I'm pretty sure you all have the software and set up on your on your country programs as is. So I think hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Uh, thanks very much, and I uh, hope you guys are doing well under lockdown over there. Um, okay, 